stand for Bible class. I'd like to welcome our guests too. Thank you for coming. As you can see, we always have room available here. Tonight we'll be in the essence of God again on sovereignty number 10. And we'll be in Exodus chapters 1 through 12. We're talking about the, the Pharaoh here and the hardness of his heart. And uh, we saw a little glimpse into that last time. We hadn't gotten any, into any of the, the plagues yet, but uh, we're, we're coming up to them. And uh, we'll see how the process unfolds. So before we get started, let's take a moment of silent prayer and what we do in that time is we uh, take the time to confess or admit our sins to God the Father. Uh, that's a private issue. That's between you and God. None of my business. Uh, and then we can be uh, cleansed from all unrighteousness as 1 John 1 9 tells us and then we are able to grow and glorify God um, in the power of the Holy Spirit. So let's take a moment and do that and let's pray. Dear Father, thank you for the ability to um, be here tonight. We know that um, you're always faithful in our, your plan toward us and allowing us to be a part of it. We're grateful for that. And we thank you for uh, your son, Jesus Christ. And we also want to um, just pray for guidance in the word, uh, clarity tonight, so we can better get to know you as uh, our God and also to uh, apply your word in our daily lives. We thank you. For these things, in Jesus Christ's name, amen. So we're well on our way, I'd say, to seeing, it's kind of a lot of buzz around the hardness of Pharaoh's heart, I feel like, and, uh, and I, it's good reason to have buzz around it. You know, uh, you wonder how people's heart get to a place where there is no going back. And we've all seen it. I think we've seen people in that position where we have a desire to help, uh, but they don't allow that help to penetrate through their heart. And, and it really goes back to uh, that process that we are referring to of rejection. And long enough, uh, a long enough time of rejection will make a person's heart uh, impenetrable to uh, anything good or true. Now that doesn't mean they're a completely lost cause because we do have volition we can always turn the tide on that, right? So, uh, but it does show you that we have a part to play in our own spiritual status of the soul, right? And so, uh, as believers, we, I like to look at you as sponges. You know, we're kind of human sponges. You lose that sponge, uh, that ability to absorb the truth as you, your heart becomes hardened. And all that means is that the less you take in the word, the less you will be able to take it in. And so it takes consistency. It takes, uh, uh, you know, uh, frequency, you could say, uh, doing it over and over and over. And we become just, you know, when you set us down on the counter, the water is just sucked up, uh, the living water, right? The word of God. So, um, but we'll see that Pharaoh has lost that ability and we looked at some of the background that got us up to where Moses is. I don't want to go all through that again, but um, we started way back. Uh, I guess I could have went back to Adam and Eve, but you know that would have took a long time to get back to where we were. So we started with Joseph, and remember God injected him into Egypt. He rose to the top in rank. He was promoted. Started off as a slave, was promoted. And then Joseph was the one who brought his family members into Egypt. That's how the Jews got there. Remember, they started out with 70 Jews uh, in Egypt. Uh, the Pharaoh got a little concerned, or a lot concerned, and he was very nervous about the Jews becoming too big, too large, and taking over and turning on, on him. And so that's when they went into slavery. That was his solution. That was the, the human solution to fix, um, uh, you know, uh, what only a, a spiritual, problem that God can fix, but that's Pharaoh's solution. 
put them in slavery, and we'll solve the dilemma of maybe that they might take over. So we'll see that it doesn't really work, but um, he's giving it a go anyways. So remember that Joseph, or Moses, when he, he got to Egypt, he committed murder, or when he was in Egypt, he grew up in Egypt, he committed murder, he murdered one of the Egyptians that were beating one of the Jews, and that's why he fled Egypt. And um, I think I might have told you a wrong number, but um, anyways, I wanted to clarify on, on how long he was gone. He was gone about 40 years, and so he was about 40 years old when he actually did the, the, the murder, and he left to Midian, and that was about 40 years that he stayed there. So um, quite a bit of time to, um, you know, to reevaluate circumstances. We think of months, years as a long time. Forty years is a long time, but you see what it takes to get to the point in Moses' life where he can actually accomplish God's mission. It took him 40 years to get to a place where he could even, and he, we still see him doubting. But obviously God knew that he had the spiritual uh, things that he needed in his soul to rely on God enough when the circumstances got hot. And he did. Moses was growing during that time. And sometimes we all need a little bit of separation out of the you know, hustle and bustle, out of life, and God will move us to a different position, maybe a different location geographically. Um, maybe a different job, maybe less pay. You know, sometimes we have to uh, grow in a way that isn't necessarily in accordance with the world, right? Everybody sees everything going on the upward swing and all of a sudden you're, you know, the CEO of the Empire State Building. You know, that's not God's plan necessarily. And so we see Moses uh, probably felt like he took a step back. But the reality is, He's in some very uh, personal training, you could say, in Midian, and it was 40 years. So don't think that just because you may take a little detour in your life that that's a bad thing, because God is always in the background preparing, as we saw last time. So Midian was about 360 miles away, so um, it took Moses a little while to get there on foot. Um, so we got to the point where God commissions Moses in the bush, in the service. He came to the burning bush and he spoke to him. And uh, he told him what he wanted to do. He wanted to free the Jews, free his people out of slavery from Pharaoh. And remember, there had been enough time in God's eyes that had passed because he heard the Jews calling out to him. So we saw there's enough time in the Jews that had passed. They were good. They were ripe. They were humble enough. And there was also enough time in Moses' position where he had enough humility. And we brought it back to the humility, how important that is in our lives as well. I feel like that is the most important thing that we can have in the Christian way of life, humility. You know, God can't use us if we don't have the necessary humility that we need to be able to glorify him in every situation that we find ourselves in. Because if he can't be glorified, that means that the focus goes inverted back to us. And when you're talking about a, a, a mission that Moses is on, this huge thing that God wants to use us in, big things that he has planned for us, we've got to have a tremendous amount of humility, tremendous amount of humility. And you know, it's to the point where it's a sacrificial humility as the scripture describes Christ as going through to get to the cross. For us, it's for everyone else. It wasn't for himself, it was for uh, you and me. And he was under orders, of course, by the Father. But you get the point. Um, humility is, 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 the hu is a very huge thing in the spiritual, spiritual life. So, um, so God will use, use you throughout your life. And He will use you incrementally. He will use you um, in different ways, in different places, with different people, with different personalities. And there will be an advancement in the way He uses you. Not necessarily... Uh, 
Remember, in the worldly sense, as people see advance, but in accordance with your spiritual advance in your life. So wherever you are personally, God will maximize on that to the, your fullest potential, wherever that is, whether it be uh, you know, administration, maybe helps, the gift of compassion, uh, prayer. You know, there's a lot of gifts, teaching. There's so many gifts, um, uh, giving that are out there that all have to do with other people. And if you can't be around other people, guess what you need? A certain level of humility to be in the certain whatever position that we need to be in. So Proverbs, I want to just mention a little, talk a little bit about humility because it's an important feature, uh, not only for our Christian lives, but in Moses' life too. So Proverbs 22, 4. And keep in mind, we're really talking about promotion, aren't we? Promotion in the plan of God. If we all want to be in a better place spiritually and know for a fact this is where God wants me to be, this is what we're referring to, humility and promotion. These things go together. This is a major promotion that Moses is getting to be commissioned to go rescue the Jews out of slavery. That is a promotion right here. Proverbs 22, 4. I have a slide. It says, the result of... Humility is the fear of the Lord, riches, honor, and life. There you go. Uh, we've got a lot of passages on humility, don't we? There is a lot of passages on humility. You could say uh, either the result of or because of humility, these things. You've got a healthy respect and a fear for the Lord, which means what? You're always in tune with your spiritual life. If you have a healthy fear of the Lord, this is your number one priority. Spiritual food, growth in the spiritual realm is your top dog priority. That's a healthy fear of the Lord. If we have that healthy fear, a respect, it's always on our mind. We know we have to have it to function. It's like a car pulling into the gas station. It's no different for us. We need these things. When we step outside these doors, how are we supposed to think? Well, did we get our fuel? Because that's where the fear of the Lord comes from. It not only it's it's remember, it's circular. It comes from his word and it gets us to knowing the source and also respecting and coming back to the source for more. So he gives us the humility, gives us the respect. Um, and it that's the grace of God, right? It comes from him and it allows us to be drawn to him to get more of it. And you got to love that about God because once he starts to pour on us, he doesn't stop. It doesn't stop. So when I see verses like this, you know, I get excited because you see things like riches and honor and life. If anyone wants to live on this earth, these are the things we want to see, you know, and this could be spiritual. This can be physical. This can be. Uh, and when we're talking about honor, what's honorable to God? Maybe what's not honorable to the world. So think about things differently when it comes to how does God feel about a certain situation? How does God feel about riches? Maybe it is physical riches. Is physical riches are in your, uh, in your, in His plan for you. That will be a part of it. Um, but if it's not, guess what? We should be happy with whatever God chooses that we need to be a part of. It all goes back to humility, it really goes back to humility. Moses was obviously to a place where he could, you know, you could almost sense the humility when he was starting to doubt. You know, there's a level of humility. I understand there's also a fear you can get off on the wrong track. It went, doubt is, is in a way he wasn't trusting in God as well. But, you know, there's a sense of humility in that, you know, in, in that he's not rely. He, he knows he can't do it because maybe he is thinking, well, you know, I, this is impossible on my own. Uh, just the other end of that. What do you what do you think? I can do everything. I can I can defeat the world. So I think he's on the right track. He's just applying it wrongly. He's doubting uh, not only himself, but God as well. So. Um, so it's a big topic. 
Um, so when we think of these words, just remember that greatness in the spiritual life is not necessarily tied to greatness in the world. You know, in my mind, at least, you know, growing up spiritually and just growing up in general, you know, we tie those things together often. As human beings, that's a natural thing to do for us because that's what we're, that's what we see. That's what we're in. Um, we're in the world, but we're not of the world, right? So we have to remember that what you see is not necessarily indicative of the spiritual part of a person. You know, there's very, a lot of unhappy people that have a lot of riches and honor from a human sense. When you have these things from a divine sense given by God because he's given them, he's opened the doors. We haven't gone through life kicking down doors on our own. He's promoted. It's a completely different honor. It's a different riches. It's not something that will go away. And if it does go away, it was all a part of God's plan. Now, the other way is what full of things that may disappear because of our own bad decisions. You know, usually when you're on the other fence of this, you are uh, on your own plan. You're on your own will. You're on your own path in life. And that's not a, not, it's a scary place to be, at least from a believer's perspective that knows and respects the Lord, not necessarily someone that's in that position because they don't know any better, right? They just know that they're receiving adversity and it hurts sometimes. God just trying to get them back on track. Any pain in life, God, God is uh, always trying to get us back on track. Unless you're being tested and that's strengthening. Remember persevering is part of this? Don't forget about that part. So, Moses has humility and God is maximizing on it. Uh, on the flip side, we have this verse, Proverbs 11, 2. When pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with the humble is wisdom. You see, there's a, there's a, a theme happening here of humility and the good things that come out of being humble. So far, we've seen honor and now wisdom are found in humility, both great things. And part of this is that we are commanded to not be in the world or of the world. Excuse me, you're, you're in the world just to make sure, you know, pinch yourself. We're here. We're physically here. But the thinking is not to be of the world. The thinking is to be different when you step out of here because you are a spiritual a child of God in the family of God. And, you know, there's a sense of royalty that the scripture tells us that that carries. Naturally, it's not because of something I can do. It's because of what God has given you in grace. That's the royalty part of the Christian life. You know, being in royalty means that you have access to things that not any other people have access to. Now I'm talking about believers in Jesus Christ. These things are very unique, they're very powerful, and they're the things that God himself uh, gives us, which is him. And remember, we talked a little bit about prayer. That's one of those powerful things that we all have. But, um, but God wants everyone on board. That is no secret. He wants us all on board. And why I wanted to mention this is, is because one of the results of getting on board is humility. Whether we do it early on, whether we do it in the middle of our spiritual life, or whether we do it later, God will work on you in life and circumstances and testing to get you to a point where he can maximize on just what he's doing in Moses' life. It's no different with you. No different. And there's a ton of verses. I'm not going to go through a lot of them, all of them, but here are two more. But he gives greater grace. Therefore, it says God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. James 4.10, humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. There's your word for promote. This is Moses' verse right here all the way. Humility means exaltation. Exaltation. It's a good thing. So, you know, 
you got to say, well, if you really want to start having fun, think about humility. You know, that's a struggle. There's a battle there going on in our souls. We're naturally uh, on top king of the mountain. That, that's the way we operate. That's the way we were born. But it's not the spiritual life. So there is a battle and there's some things that we have to come to grips with in our own spiritual life. Um, but it all goes back to this. You know, God's wanting you to enjoy this, what this is talking about, the greater grace. Um, and, and we have access to that. That's what he wants us to have. But we have to get there on our own. That takes the decision after decision on your part. So, I mean, and when I think about greater grace, Moses is experiencing that right now. He's actually backpedaling. When God promotes, it may be something that, you know, is immediately like, wow. It may be something like Moses is doing, like he may be a little fearful of what's coming, of where God is using him. You know, I can't do this type of thing. Um, it could be a lot of things, but you see what God's doing. He's promoting, maximizing on Moses' spiritual life just so he can get Moses in a position to lead the Jews. This isn't a one or two week deal, right? We know this is a lasting thing. He's got to lead them to the land, uh, the promised land. So this is a job and you have to look at your life as service to God, service to God. Everything that we do is service to God. Everything, work, friends, relationships, everything, everything. And when we do that, we can be prepared for the promotions that God will give. That's what his word promises. We just have to be ready for him. So Moses temporarily got his eyes off God, but that doesn't mean he's not spiritually ready. God wouldn't have called him if he wasn't spiritually ready. So, and we saw that that was an application issue, remember? We talked about how we can feel really confident in our spiritual life. We're growing, we're growing, we're growing, we're confident. And then when the, the problem hits or the adversity hits, we just lo we lose it. We lose all application. Everything just hits the floor. That's what's happening to Moses here. When the test arrives, sometimes we fall apart. Um, but you have to begin to look at everything in the circumstances of life as Christian service. Not as chance, as Christian service. Nothing happens by chance. How many times have you heard that? That's a fact. That is a fact. God knows, He has always known, that whatever is happening in your life was well thought of in advance. And well, He well prepared you and He knew it was going to take place. And He will not allow you to be in a position that is beyond your capabilities. That should put you at ease. Whatever he has you in, whatever position you can handle. Is it going to stretch you? It depends on you. I just told you that God will, will get, put you in a position that will not go beyond your capabilities. Now, whether it stretches you or not is up to you. That's a faith issue. But whatever the case is, you know for sure that God will not place you in a position that is beyond your capabilities. So, and realize that Moses' promotion is, is very unique. Okay? It is unique. But it's all here. So, so we're to the point where Moses' faith is lacking even though God is speaking directly to him. Remember that? Um, but another part of this equation I think is very important is faith. Faith, faith, faith in your personal life. You know, faith solves every problem. It's involved in solving every problem, isn't it? It is. Because faith is the reality of things unseen. 
That's the reality of your application becoming real. The link, the bridge is trusting. It's believing the God that we know and love and believing that he says what he says is true. And so that's how important faith is when it comes to what's next. Where is God going to take me? What's he going to do in my life? There, there is a serious amount of trust that is involved in that. I don't want us to forget about that. Because even though Moses is to a place in his life where he's spiritually, you know, mature, we could say, there's also a level of faith that comes with that that is, has to be rock solid. If we don't trust God in situations in our life, how can he trust you to do whatever you need to do? He can't. And he won't put you there, right? But if you're there, he knows that you have the ability to not only claim his word and his promises, but also believe them. And that's a big deal because it may seem like a very, you know, small uh, thing and detail, but believers grow and they become better and better at believing the words God tells us. And we've heard all of our life, but we didn't believe them here. But now we too are, are to a place in our life where we do believe them. We do believe them. We trust them. We've seen it work. He's proved it over and over to us again. So faith, and remember, how does it come? It comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. That's how we grow in faith. It's not by seeing, it's by hearing. Isn't that interesting? By hearing and, and by seeing, I, I'm, I'm not talking about you can't read and intake the word of God. What I mean is it doesn't take physical circumstances to grow your faith. God doesn't have to show us anything to grow your faith. Your faith grows from learning about who he is and then applying that to your life. This is a soul issue. This is a mind and soul issue, faith, belief. Now, will you see? Yes. That will naturally come with the faith. God will show all along the way but he says where it comes from, it comes from his word. It comes directly from his word. That's just the, the, one of the attributes of truth. Absolute truth is what builds people. It builds your confidence. It builds everything about you. It builds your spiritual life. And it builds your faith. That's the core of this, right? So... And we have the word of Christ, don't we? Yes, we do. So in order to trust and to know we are making decisions in accordance with God's directive will. Remember, he directs us through his scripture. That's what he does. Um, there has to be an understanding of him already in place. And I say already because it happened, had to happen yesterday for you to apply today. It has to already be there. You can't go through the thing and think, okay, I should have done it. I should have, should have, could have, would have, right? That's what we all say. It has to be there. It has to be there. And I mean, this is the area why I wanted to emphasize it because God desires us to know him and he desires us to follow him. That's the faith growing process right there. But guess what? Those are the two areas that Satan loves to distract us in. If he can distract you in getting to know God and following God, he will. Why? Because he knows that's where you're growing in faith and you're starting to trust in God. And guess what's being diminished? Satan's tactics. You begin to learn about Satan and you know that he is not only powerless, but the things that he does does not work. And you begin to see through them the more you go down this road. Remember, light shines in the darkness and you can see. And he knows that. So that's the areas that he will attack. And that's why we also have a lot of lukewarm believers. Hello, that's the majority. You're the minority, right? 
You, you've gone through the, the you, you've gone, you're tired of getting, putting, getting the curtains pulled over your eyes and we're here. There's a lot of tactics and you know, we're, we're in a fallen world and this is Satan's world because he's, God has placed Satan here and he's allowed him a certain amount of power, of course not total, right? Not total power, to influence, to persuade, and to guide. Um, but as we'll see later, there's something that's required that's a part of that puzzle and it's called your volition. Satan can't do a thing without you allowing him to do a thing. Now that's big. That's a big deal because what does that render him if you don't allow him? Powerless. Powerless. So, so after Moses complained enough to God, it says that God got angry with him. He, it actually says his anger burned against him. He got a little irritated because, you know, Moses is to a level where he, he, know, he knows better, but he keeps doubting, right? God volunteers Aaron at this point to help him. Aaron's going to help Moses. This is when he, he says, okay, Aaron's going to help. Um, and he tells them, he keeps comforting them, I'm going to provide for them, provide for you. He's going to tell them what to say. And they just have to make right decisions, right? But it's interesting, after Moses decides to go, don't get too rushed in this, by the way. I told myself I was going to take my time. You know, I tend to, I tend to rush through things, but we can, we can relax and we can go through something and we can learn a lot of things, I think, if we just take our time. I'm not going to take our, my time. I'm not going to, you know, 12 chapters, if I go through this like I went through Ephesians, it would take me five years. I'm not going to go through it that slow. But I do want to hit on some important points. What's interesting is that after Moses decided to go, we have this verse right here. Now the Lord said to Moses in Midian, remember he's still in Midian, go back to Egypt for all the men who were seeking your life are dead. Are dead. So Moses took his wife and his sons and mounted them on a donkey and returned to the land of Egypt. Moses also took the staff of God in his hand. Now, isn't that kind of interesting? You know, I'm willing to bet that Moses, the reason why he had cold feet, was because he was thinking about when he murdered that Egyptian. And it's funny to think that God didn't tell him this before Moses accepted. He didn't mention that. That would have cleared things up. Oh, everybody's dead. Okay, I'm on board. If this was the problem why Moses was doubting. And I, I kind of, I'm kind of thinking it is. And because God waited until after the fact. Why did he do that? Well, because God has to allow us to come up to our own conclusions on our own. That's what part of faith means. We have to come up to our own conclusions about what we believe and how convicted you are. God is on the other side. He's the absolute part of the side of faith. See, we are the side that doubts or that accepts or that rejects or somewhere in between there. We can't have God give us all the details before we make a decision. What, what's faith if God's going to give you everything about everything that's going to happen that you don't know about? There's no faith. If someone tells you all the things that are going to, oh, no, you won't get hurt. This is going to be okay. And answer all your questions, all your doubts, everything that you're wondering. No reason to have trust. Faith is belief in the unseen. So the entire spiritual life requires you to trust in God. It doesn't require for God to show you before you can trust. That's the spiritual life right here in a nutshell. And it's interesting to me that the same exact thing happens to us many times. It really does. Think about it in your life. Um, you know, when we finally get to a point of passing a test in our thinking, then God shows us that all the things we are worried about weren't even an issue. They weren't even an issue. It's funny. It's like, oh, my 
gosh, you know, I was, I was worrying about all these things. I spent all this time worrying and they weren't even an issue. It's almost like God's sense of humor coming through. You know, he's like, you know, see, if you would have trusted a long time ago, you could have saved yourself a lot of heartache, a lot of headache, and maybe even a lot of years, according to Moses, right? I mean, you got to think about these things. Decisions, God knows the decisions that we made, and he, they're already set in stone for him, but they're not for us. You know, this is life is fluid. Things change, but it's not for God. It's like a record playing for him because he knows what's going to happen. But at the same time, this application, I think we can, we can very well see because it's so real. We live it. We live by faith, not by sight. Isn't that what the scripture tells us? We have to take that to heart. We can't expect God to walk us by the hand up to the edge of the cliff or jump with us off the diving board. There's that gap there. Is he going to jump with you? Yes, he will. But it takes you trusting that he's going to jump or that <laughs> you get my point that he's going to be with you. Okay. So, you know, we could save a lot of time. There's a lot of time wasted in worry. There's a lot of time wasted in worry. There's a lot of heartache. There's a lot of tears. There's a lot of pain. And I'm including fear in this. I'm including fear, worry, anxiety, all these things. There's a lot, you know, that we can preclude, we can bypass if we just flip this on its head and that bring that faith that's on the bottom and bring it to the top. We, we, that's, you know, you want to move forward faster in the spiritual life. We're just talking about humility. Humility takes faith. Faith takes humility. You know, there's a certain amount of obedience that is required in both of those, in both of those. We want to be obedient so we can get to this point in our spiritual life. That's where we want to be. So right after Moses passes this huge test in his soul to go in his soul, he's already accepted. God says, and oh, yeah, all those people who you were worrying about, they're dead. Most. Oh, my goodness. Why'd you wait to tell me that? But that's how it works. It takes faith. So we have the first mentioning of the hardening of Pharaoh's heart here in Exodus 4, 21. It says, the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders which I have put in your power. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Now, it's clear here that we can see that God is going to harden. This is very clear that God is the one who is going to harden Pharaoh's heart, right? We got that. The word harden is the Hebrew word kazak, and it means to grow firm or strong, to strengthen. And here's the definition that I tend to gravitate to, to become gradually acclimatized to unfavorable conditions. Harden the heart. See, that's a process. We talked about that, right? When Pharaoh is growing to be hardened, he's, when you become acclimatized to something, you become numb or you become used to it is a good way to say it. Um, I used to do a lot of land surveying at one point in my life. And one of the things that we had to do, you ever see those guys looking through the instruments on the side of the road? That was me. Well, one of the things we had to do when we got there is set the instrument up and just let it sit there for a minute because it had to become acclimatized. This is a laser measuring, you know, half a mile or somewhere in between, in between that. If it's not acclimatized, if it's not, you know, to the temperature that it needs to be internally and externally, your measurements are going to be off. Right. When you look through that scope and you're looking at someone, you see waves like this going because of the heat. There's things that happen in there that, you know, really are kind of amazing. 
But you get the point. The instrument gets used to something. It can handle those measurements because it's acclimatized. It can better take a measurement, right? Same thing with Pharaoh's heart. But look where the direction it's going. It's going to unfavorable conditions. Unfavorable conditions. Not favorable. He's not getting to a point where he can take in the word. He's getting to a point where he completely rejects the word. Totally. That's acclimatized in, the, in this sense. So, you can, first you can see that this is a gradual a hardening process, right? But it also consists of a person's continual and consistent negative volition towards God. But we do have proof here that God says he will harden. Don't forget that. Keep that in the back of your mind. And also note one thing here. This is future. This is future. God hasn't said, I've already hardened. He hasn't, he's not saying, I am hardening. He's saying, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. That's one thing to keep in the back of your mind as we go through this, because there is a point in the story where God decides, that's it. That's it. The justice of God steps in. Now, the part of this, 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 verb here in, in the Hebrew is a little different because it's in the PL stem, which means there's an intensification of the hardening. Remember when we talked about God has seen and heard that intensification of what it magnified when God did it? Now, apply that to the hardening process. To me, that sounds like there's no turning back. Um, is that fair? Yes, because God is fair and just. You know, if it wasn't fair, it'd be like saying, well, it's not fair if we die. It is fair that we die. And it's fair that we die at a certain point. And it's fair that we, you know, God chooses the timing of that death. Do I know all the details? Do you know all the details? No. We don't, we aren't given access to that information, right? But at the same time, we know that God is just in this decision. And sometimes it's kind of hard to wrap your brain around because, you know, well, what if God would have given him one more, one more chance? Well, we'll talk about that. We'll see how many chances Pharaoh got before he got to this point. Now, this intensification just means if you have a sentence that says uh, he broke the glass, it would change the translation to say he shattered the glass in the Hebrew. So when you think of hardening, you know, I don't know another word. Uh, he petrified his heart, maybe? I, I don't know. Um, but you get it. It's an intensification, okay? There's an extreme, uh, in other words, the damage is too severe and there's no going back. That's a good way to put it, right? The, the damage is just too severe. Because God can damage in his overruling will, as we know in our life physically. We've seen damage in our own bodies. We've seen damage to people, and we've seen um, how that works. So it's no, um, it's not hard for God to do. We could say that. The heart is, God has access to all his sovereignty and his power. So just keep in mind, as we're going through this, God is a sovereign God, and he's also a just and righteous God. So that means he's in full control, even with our decisions. He's still in full control. That plan's still moving forward, and he's perfectly fair, and he's right in every decision that he makes. I'm just describing the God that we know and the only God of the universe right now. So, which means that the hardening he is doing is justified. It's justified. It's not only justified, but we can take that to the extreme and say it is completely right and necessary and timely, very timely. There's a lot of things that come into mind when you say, you know, that happened, but you know what? There's, no, there's none of that when, when God makes a decision to do something. We don't know the details of Pharaoh's life, the decisions that he made leading up to that. We have an insight right here how he dealt with the Jews. 
We know that he was a very, he, we know he was an unbeliever. We know that he was uh, very hard on the Jews in slavery. But we don't know all the other bad decisions that he had. God does. And I also thought it was a little strange. Did you notice that the end of that says, it says, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. And that, you know, you would think it'd be opposite, so that he will let the people go. I thought that was a little, you know, kind of strange. But you, you, what, what we have here is you have God's overruling will and you have the human will. And remember, they're at odds. They're going in the opposite direction. And, and this is going, for us, going to be, God tells us exactly what it's going to be in Romans 9, 17 and Exodus 9, 16. And we'll read it now because this would be a good thing to close on because this is the purpose of why God is doing this. Why doesn't he harden their hearts to let them go? He's hardening his heart to not let him go. If you want to run in that direction, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to show you how powerful of a God that I am. And that's exactly what he does. Look at Romans 9, 17. I don't know if I gave you a slide on this. Nope. Well, let me start with this. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, here we go. This is quoted from the Old Testament from Exodus. For this very purpose, I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you, in you. Not just demonstrate my power in Pharaoh and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. There you go. God is allowing and making him turn the complete opposite direction just to show us, the Jews, the entire world, because we have it written now in Revelation of God's power. He just says it right here. He says, I'm going to demonstrate, to demonstrate. So, you know, it makes perfect sense to me as, first of all, why God would harden Pharaoh's heart and not let the people go. If you want to show people how powerful and how unstoppable you are, you're going to drive them to the extreme and say, hey, go for it. You want to defeat me? You want to reject me? You want to deny me? I'll give you every chance that you have, and I'll even help you go in the direction that you're going, and I'm still going to win, right? God always wins, and he's going to in this situation too. So just remember that this has a lot to do with God's sovereignty being in full control despite satanic attacks. Don't ever lose focus of Satan in this picture. Remember, Pharaoh's an unbeliever. The Egyptians pray to a lot of false gods. There's a lot of idolatry happening at this time. This is satanic territory. So Satan is working, as we'll see, even in these plagues. Remember the magicians all throughout this? Satan's working his powers that are really superhuman powers, which he has available to him that God allows him to do even here on this earth. He's allowed to do these things. That's the key. But God is showing that he has absolutely no power is what he's showing. Because what does it take? What did I tell you earlier that it takes to give Satan his power? It takes volition. It takes volition to give Satan his power. But guess who doesn't need volition? God. He doesn't need it. He doesn't need agreement. He doesn't need people on board. He doesn't need these things. So you see how powerless Satan is when it comes to his plan, when it comes to influencing, when it comes to blinding the people. It takes somebody being negative to the truth and being on board with Satan's ideas, false concepts, to move his plan forward, or he thinks it's moving forward. But to God, he says, go for it. Go for it. My plan is still going to move forward, and I'm going to show you that. That's what he's going to show us through Pharaoh. So, and then let me read this, and I do have a slide for this. We read 4, 9, or no, I read 4, 
seven, uh, Romans 9, 17 to you, and here is uh, verse 18. It says, So then he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. You will say to me then, Why does he still find fault? For who resists his will? On the contrary, who are you, O man, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, Why did you make me like this, will it? And the obvious answer is no. You see how tiny we are in the big picture? When I think about a pot being molded, you know, the molder can do whatever he wants to do. He can, do, he can make whatever pot that he wants. He can throw the clay in the trash. He can do whatever he wants. He can even poke a hole in, in that pot and have you a leaky pot, right? But it, it, this verse shows me that, you know, how powerful God is in comparison to our volition. We're the, mold, we're the ones being molded. Even though we have free will, don't discount that. Don't ever lose sight of that, but you're still the pot. You're still the pot. And we have a molder that is molding this whole plan together. So an awesome thought. It really is. So that's a good place to stop, and we'll, we'll continue with this uh, on Sunday. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your grace. As always, thank you for Jesus Christ. Uh, because your plan tells us that everything in the spiritual realm, we have complete and total access through through Jesus Christ. Not only that, but you've provided these things for absolutely nothing. Jesus Christ paid the penalty. He went to the cross. He died for every sin of all humanity for one purpose, just so we had the option the option to live a fantastic spiritual life. And all you told us through your word, you tell us, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That is it. That's the grace of God that is amazing and powerful and that Satan cannot stop because it takes faith. It takes belief in Jesus Christ. We thank you so much for your plan. Thank you for your grace. And thank you for showing us how powerful you are through your word. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.